Alright, strap in everyone. Today we're going deep, behind the scenes of Star Wars. Episode I, we're uncovering the secrets of Darth Maul, one of the most visually striking characters. And can you believe Phantom Menace just turned 25? A quarter century, double-bladed lightsabers and all. It seems like just yesterday. Yeah, right? Yeah. And today we're focusing on the creative journey behind these characters before they ever hit the screen. Lucky for us, we have this fantastic interview with Ian McCaig. He was the concept artist on episode I, the mastermind behind Darth Maul and a bunch of other iconic designs. This interview with McCaig is gold, really. We get to see not just what these designs look like, but the why behind them. He was right there in the thick of it with George Lucas, seeing the creative process unfold. So Darth Maul, his origin story is not what you'd think. Apparently George Lucas was pretty vague at the start. He just said, Darth Maul, our new Sith Lord. And that was it. Wow, can you imagine? McCaig had to create a whole new visual language for the Sith, and all he had to go on was Darth Vader. <laughs> Talk about pressure. He even tried designing helmets for Maul, trying to out-helmet Darth Vader, as he put it. But it just wasn't working. That's so classic, though. Sometimes your initial ideas, the ones you're sure will work, just fall flat. And then, boom, out of those failures comes something totally unique. And get this, it was actually his colleagues who kind of accidentally helped him find that unique path. McCaig started doodling, drawing all these circuits on their faces for fun, and somehow that evolved into those amazing tattoos. From circuits to tattoos, that's a big shift. It takes Maul from just a technological villain to something way more primal, ritualistic even. You immediately get the sense that there's a whole deeper history, a whole culture behind those markings. And then finally, Lucas gives him some real direction. He tells McCaig to design Maul as a vision from your worst nightmare. Okay, now this is where it gets really interesting. McCaig had this spooky experience in his studio late one night. He felt like he was being watched, and he even pictured this creepy pale face grinning at him through the window. No way, that's terrifying. Did he actually draw that face for Lucas? He did, and Lucas's reaction, he was apparently horrified, slammed the folder shut and said, give me your second worst nightmare. Oh man, I gotta know what the second nightmare was. It's perfect. McCaig said he's terrified of clowns, Bozo the Clown specifically. So those tattoos, those markings, they were designed to evoke those same feelings of unease. Like there's something sinister hiding right there beneath the surface. You're telling me Darth Maul's terrifying face is partly inspired by a childhood fear of Bozo the Clown. That's wild. It really is. It shows how the most random things, even silly childhood fears, can spark powerful images. And it reminds us that what scares one person might not even phase another. What stands out to you about that? I'm thinking about all those hidden influences we carry around. Little anxieties, childhood memories that shape our creative output, even if we don't realize it. But <laughs> Darth Maul isn't just scary tattoos. There's a strange beauty to him, too, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Even the horns, which McCaig originally imagined as feathers, add to that. He deliberately added that element of beauty, of seduction even, to the dark side. It suggests a cunning intelligence behind the brute force. It's fascinating how McCaig later tried to rework Darth Maul as a female character, even designing this striking Sith witch with a black and white face that Lucas ultimately rejected for Maul. Yeah, but that design had a second life, didn't it? It was resurrected years later for Mother Talzin in the Clone Wars, Darth Maul's mother. It shows how rich McCaig's ideas were, how they could be adapted and find new life in different corners of the Star Wars universe. Speaking of other parts of that universe, we can't skip Queen Amidala. McCaig's design process for her was just as fascinating. Lucas gave him Princess Ozma from The Wizard of Oz as a starting point, but then hit him with this huge question, what makes Star Wars Star Wars? That's a loaded question, right? It sent McCaig down all these interesting paths, he ended up exploring a pre-industrial society where the tech is still handcrafted. And you see that reflected in the elaborate, almost Art Nouveau aesthetic of Imidala's costumes and the whole world of Naboo. Space Nouveau, he called it. I love that. It perfectly describes that blend of futuristic tech with that almost handmade artisanal feel. And his research process was incredible. Digging through historical fashion archives, drawing inspiration from nature at Skywalker Ranch, talk about diverse influences. Didn't you have a rule of three? He'd try to find elements for each design from three different cultures or time periods. Exactly. He was tapping into those universal archetypes, the visual elements that resonate across cultures and time. And that's how he gave those designs that timeless feel. Like they could exist in any galaxy, any era. Like Amidala's white face paint. McCaig found examples of that in Japanese geishas, Mongolian women, even Queen Elizabeth I of England. 
It's amazing how these seemingly unrelated references can come together to create something that feels both familiar and completely alien. It speaks to McCaig's talent for combining different influences into something unique. My mind is officially blown, but we've got to touch on the Jedi because McCaig designed their costumes too. And there's this one little detail about Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn that I find so interesting. Oh, you're talking about the name swap. It seems small, but it adds so much depth to Obi-Wan's story. Originally, the older Jedi was Obi-Wan and the younger one was Qui-Gon. Lucas swapped them at the last minute. Which makes Qui-Gon's death even more poignant, don't you think? He passes on not just his mission, but his name, too. It's like this symbolic passing of the torch. Yeah. And it adds a whole new layer to that moment in A New Hope when Obi-Wan says, Obi-Wan. Now, that's a name I've not heard in a long time. Yeah, it's like he carries a piece of Qui-Gon with him, this constant reminder of his fallen master. Exactly. A beautifully subtle way to make the story even more emotionally resonant. Okay, and speaking of storytelling, we have to talk about what it was like for McCaig to work with George Lucas. Sounds like it was a master class in visual storytelling. Totally. McCaig didn't just design, he also storyboarded key sequences, visualizing scenes before they were ever shot. Lucas seems to have had a hands-off approach at first, like he was telling a bedtime story, revealing bits of the script each week, and just letting the artists go wild. That's right, giving them the freedom to explore and then coming in with focused feedback. That kind of leadership really fosters creativity and allows for those happy accidents that can lead to something brilliant. And talk about happy accidents. Yeah. That Tatooine cockfight scene, the lightsaber duel between Qui-Gon Jinn and Darth Maul. Lucas wanted it fast, dangerous, but McCaig's first storyboard was too slow. So Lucas jumps in, right? Literally rips boards off the wall, rearranges them, speeds the whole thing up. He even told McCaig, always follow the action, which is such a valuable lesson for any creative process. It's amazing, right? Yeah. Sometimes you have to be ruthless with your own work, even if it means tearing down something you poured hours into. But Lucas wasn't always about tearing things down. He could be surprisingly specific when he needed to be. Like with Anakin's pod racer, Lucas wanted it based on a very specific car, a birdcage Maserati. But none of the designs were hitting the mark. So guess what he did? Grabbed a piece of paper and drew the car himself in perfect three-point perspective. Wait, Lucas can draw? Like, really draw. I had no idea. That's incredible. Apparently so. It just goes to show even the most visionary directors sometimes have to get hands-on with the details. And even they have those moments of, hold on, I can do that too. It gives me such a new appreciation for all the thought and care that went into making Episode I. I'm ready to rewatch it with a fresh perspective. Me too. It's amazing what you learn by taking a peek behind the curtain like this. But we're not done yet. There's one more fascinating piece of McCaig's story to explore his personal connection with Star Wars. Right, because, believe it or not, he wasn't a huge Star Wars fan at first. He was much more into American graffiti, of all things. I know, right. But his experience on Episode I, especially meeting fans at exhibitions, slowly changed his perspective. He started to understand the huge impact Star Wars has had on people's lives. But it wasn't until Andor that he really felt a personal connection to the franchise. He really connected with those themes of oppression and resistance. That even in the darkest times, individuals can make a difference. That's what really resonated with him. And now he's actually open to returning to the Star Wars universe. That's so great. It shows you never know when or how a story will truly connect with you. But we're going to have to pause our deep dive right here for now. Don't worry, though, we'll be back soon with more of Ian McCabe's incredible insights into the making of Episode I. Welcome back. It's amazing how much we've already unpacked. And we're just getting started. I know, right? It's so cool thinking about how McCabe's relationship with Star Wars changed, going from not really a fan to actually wanting to work in that universe again. It says a lot about the power of fandom. It does. Here's someone who wasn't initially drawn to Star Wars, but by creating it and connecting with fans, he started to get it. To see the impact it has had all over the world, it's almost like the story found him in the end. And I think a lot of people can relate to that, whether it's Star Wars or another franchise we love, those stories become a part of us. They connect us to each other across different generations, different cultures. Absolutely. And you know, speaking of connection, let's go back to McCaig's time working on Episode I. Remember how we talked about George Lucas's leadership style? That thing about giving artists freedom, then coming in with focused feedback? Well, McCaig actually called it the best training in the world. Watching Lucas shape ideas, bring out the best in everyone. Sounds like Lucas really built an environment of trust where people felt empowered. That's so important in creative fields. 
It really is. When you feel trusted, you're more likely to take risks, to really push the boundaries and come up with those innovative ideas, the kind that wouldn't happen otherwise. Which brings us back to that story about the birdcage Maserati. Remember how Lucas had this very specific vision for Anakin's pod racer? He wanted it inspired by that classic Italian sports car. Yes, and the design team was struggling to capture what he wanted. So out of nowhere, Lucas grabs a piece of paper and just draws the car himself. In perfect three-point perspective, too. It shows you how well Lucas understood visual language, even if he wasn't always the one sketching things out. Exactly. And it also shows he was willing to roll up his sleeves and get involved when he needed to. He wasn't just some director giving orders from afar. He was a part of the creative process all the way through. It's so cool picturing this legendary filmmaker, the creator of Star Wars, just sketching a car to help his team nail the design. It makes him seem so much more human, you know? It does. He becomes less of this mythical figure, more of a passionate artist who really cares about his craft. Okay, but let's be real for a second. Episode I wasn't perfect, was it? It got some mixed reviews, to put it mildly. And even some of McCaig's designs haven't aged all that well. That's true. But we have to remember that these films are products of their time. What might feel dated or even cheesy now was groundbreaking back then. And even if you're not crazy about every single design, there's no denying how much episode I added to the Star Wars universe. I mean, look at Darth Maul. He alone shows how creative and skilled McCaig is. And we can't forget Queen Amidala's iconic looks. They've been inspiring fashion designers and cosplayers for decades. Absolutely. And beyond individual designs, episode I expanded the whole Star Wars universe in some major ways. We were introduced to new planets, new species, new technologies. We got a glimpse into the history of the Jedi Order and the Sith. It's like reading a new chapter in your favorite book. You might not love it as much as the ones before, but still part of the same story, the same world you're so invested in. And sometimes those new chapters are necessary. They keep things fresh, they challenge our expectations, and they help us see the story in new ways. Which reminds me of what McCaig's doing now. He's writing novels, screenplays, even a musical. It's amazing to see how his creative journey has unfolded since his time at Lucasfilm. It really shows that creativity doesn't have to be limited to one medium or genre. Hmm. It can change and grow just like we do. Okay, so as we start to wrap up our deep dive, there's one more thought-provoking idea from McCaig's interview I want to bring up. I think I know what you're talking about. His comment about all the endless, untouched possibilities that still exist within the Star Wars universe. Yes. He even said he'd be open to coming back to Star Wars one day. It makes me wonder what that could look like. What new worlds, new characters, new stories might he bring to life? That's an exciting thought. The potential within that vast, ever-expanding galaxy feels truly limitless. And it's a reminder that even though these stories feel like old friends, there's always something new to discover. A new adventure waiting around every corner. And that's what makes Star Wars so captivating, don't you think? That sense of wonder, of possibility, that feeling that anything is possible if you just dare to dream big. And speaking of dreaming big, I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive and let our listeners do some dreaming of their own. Yeah, let's leave them with something to think about. So imagine you're Ian McCaig and you have the chance to create something brand new within the Star Wars universe. What would it be? What story would you tell? What characters would you bring to life? Let your imagination run wild. The galaxy is yours to explore and the possibilities are endless. Welcome back to our deep dive on I Am McCaig. Back for more. You know, looking back on his story, what really strikes me is how his passion for Star Wars grew over time. Like it wasn't all there at the beginning. It's true. We don't always start out loving something. Sometimes it takes a while for that story, that idea to really sink in, and that's okay. It really is. It shows the power of being open to new things, you know, letting passions develop naturally. But let's go back to where we started Darth Maul. That vision from McCaig's worst nightmare. Why do you think he's become such an iconic part of Star Wars? It's the mix of primal fear and that amazing design. Those tattoos, they aren't just random, they tell a story. There's a dark history there, a whole complex inner life we get a glimpse of. He is a fascinating contradiction. Menacing, yet alluring. Powerful, but graceful too. And that double-bladed lightsaber. Pure genius. Yeah, like an extension of his personality. The double-bladed lightsaber. A symbol of his duality. Striking from multiple angles, just like him. And we can't forget Ray Park, the actor who played him. 
He brought so much intensity and physicality to the role. He really got the character, that mix of aggression and, as McKay put it, cheekiness. Cheekiness? That's not a word you usually think of with a Sith Lord. I know, right? <laughs> but somehow it works. It does. It hits at that playful side of Maul. Like, he's actually enjoying the chaos he's causing. He's not just some mindless killing machine. There's a real intelligence there. A wicked one. It's funny how that cheekiness goes all the way back to McKay's initial inspiration, Bozo the Clown. Like, you put a little bit of the absurd, the unexpected, into the character. And that's why he's so memorable. He flips what we expect from a villain on its head. He's not just evil. He's captivating, entertaining, mm. dare I say, even a little cool. Okay, yeah, he is pretty cool. And that coolness, that visual impact, that's why Darth Maul is still so popular. He's everywhere. Comics, video games, animated series. He even came back after being cut in half. Talk about resilience. I think that's another reason people connect with him. He keeps coming back, defying the odds. That determination to keep fighting, even when things look impossible, it's inspiring. It makes you wonder, what other stories are out there about Darth Maul? What else could he do in the Star Wars universe? Who knows? The possibilities are endless. But... One thing's for sure, Ian McKaig, he's made a real impact on Star Wars, and I have a feeling we haven't seen the last of him. Well, that brings our deep dive on Darth Maul and the making of Episode I to a close. This has been such a fun exploration. Thanks for joining me. It really has been. And remember, the next time you see Darth Maul on screen, think about all the artistry, the inspiration, the imagination that went into creating him. And hey, maybe you'll even feel inspired to tap into your own creativity. Bring some of your dreams to life. Until next time, may the Force be with you.